The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Yes, good morning uh, or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. I want to thank everybody for um, coming on a couple of minutes early. Uh, we want to do a quick audio check before we get the session kicked off. We're a few minutes out yet, so um, we're just going to do a quick audio check. So, um, <clears throat> Dave, if we can't have you do just kind of a testing one, two, three on your side, please. Testing one, two, three. Great, thank you very much. If uh, I got some asterisks, folks, on the on the line there, um, if you could just shoot me a chat or a question through to make sure that you're hearing me and you heard Dave. Again, for those of you on the call, we want to do a quick audio check and make sure that you're hearing me talk right now. Please uh, shoot through a question or a chat to let me know that you can hear me right now, please. Thank you. All right, thank you for the audio check. I appreciate that. Again, we want to make sure everything's coming through good. So we're about uh, two minutes out from the start of the session. Um, we're going to come back on in just about 60 seconds. There'll be a brief pause, so good time to fill those coffees up. Um, not that you'll need them to stay awake for this. It's very exciting content, so uh, we'll keep you awake with the content. But if you want to fill a coffee, fill your water or whatnot, uh, we'll be back on in just 60 seconds. Thank you. All right, we're going to go ahead and uh, kind of get things moving. <clears throat> Again, I want to thank everybody for joining us. If you're here to hear Asterix Technology Group talk about enterprise architectural assessments, then you are in the right place. Um, today's session um, will be recorded, and everybody who's on the session will get a, uh, a link uh, to that recording uh, when it's complete. That should be a couple of days until we get it processed and loaded up on YouTube and onto our webpage. We'll get that over to you right away. Uh, we'll also make a copy of the PDF slides available to everybody. Um, this session is actually a redo of a session from a couple of weeks ago um, when you know the work from home orders and the quarantine and everything just kind of started. Um, a lot of these systems. <clears throat> um, you know, go to webinar, WebEx, Zoom, etc. They all kind of crashed a lot because there was just too many people using these systems at one time, um, and I don't think they were the platforms were prepared. So hopefully we can get through today um, with clean audio and we don't run into any problems. If there are, just kind of raise your hand if you hear anything funky on the audio. Uh, let us know. Uh, shoot us a question or shoot us a chat. Uh, but hopefully we'll get through this. Uh, you know, pretty pretty much unscathed. It, it appears that these platforms have kind of uh, probably added a few more pipes uh, over the last couple of weeks since everybody's working from home. But be that as it may, <clears throat> um, we want to go ahead and get things kicked off. So um, the way this will work is there'll be about a two-second pause. We'll start the recording so we can record the session. You know, we'll come in and we'll, we'll do some introductory slides and we'll hand it over to our presenter today, Dave Dorsett. I won't spoil it. I will let Dave uh, kind of go through uh, a little bit of his background when we get to that when we get to that portion of the presentation. So brief pause. We'll come back on with the recording started and we'll get things going. Bear with us one sec, folks. We just have to get the recording started. One sec, please.
Okay, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, the session is entitled Enterprise Architectural Assessments. Today's uh, presentation is brought to you by Asterix Technology Group. We'll go ahead and do a quick introduction of Asterix before we get into the content. So next slide, please. So a little bit about Asterix Technology Group. Before we get into the materials, we want to at least let you know who we are. If you're not familiar with us, if you don't regularly read our blogs, um, you know, we want to make sure you know who we are and why we think we've got a right to talk to you about these uh, subjects today. Um, we were established in 1995. The company is currently privately held. It originated uh, as the IT division of a company called APBI, which was a $300 million life science research organization. Uh, today we operate from about eight offices and, and employ just around 500 employees. Our headquarters are in beautiful Red Bank, uh, New Jersey. Uh, we operate two primary divisions, a staffing division, which has both public and private staffing of mostly scientific and IT resources. Uh, and then we also have a professional services division. The, the PS division is who you're talking to today. Uh, this is an organization who's focused on supporting science-based organizations in a variety of different ways, which we'll talk briefly about. But the companies we work with, uh, I guess you could say our target customers are going to be kind of the Fortune 1000 life science enterprises, uh, government and research institutions uh, that have large and, and very, very fast-growing IT uh, that may have... Um, you know, some, some critical staffing and compliance needs. The overall mission of the company has and always will be to deliver scalable, sustainable solutions in IT and staffing for the scientific community. Next slide, please. So we look at the different solutions uh, that we, 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 we discuss and the things that we deliver. You know, we help our clients solve pretty complex problems uh, and we bring together both uh, people and technologies. The technology that we deal with here at Asterix are obviously technologies that are predominantly used in the lab, in life science organizations. So we kind of bring, you know, that kind of that base of the pyramid here, the technology side of the fence, we bring that uh, very uh, extensive expertise in specific laboratory applications, uh, as well as the the industry standard development and database tools that are commonly used by labs. And then we bring that together with the business side of it, which is um, the ability to help our customers with laboratory management, laboratory operations, and potentially even manage services like off offloading uh, some of this technology onto our side of the fence so that you can focus uh, on the science and we would focus on the tech. And then on the science side of the fence, the people that we bring are not just, you know, technologists who know a programming language. We bring people in who know scientific technology. So staff with scientific backgrounds, practical bench experience, uh, and very broad subject matter expertise. And, and you're going to talk to one of those uh, folks today uh, in Dave Dorsett. So next slide, please. And Dave is a principal software architect. He brings uh, almost 30 years of experience in R&D informatics, uh, and he's worked in global pharmaceutical companies, chemical companies, uh, CPGs, so a really broad range of industry expertise. I know there's some folks on the call today from, from all of those walks of life, so we're, we're, we're glad to have somebody of Dave's range uh, and, and broad background. Uh, he has an extensive track record in architecting and designing and delivering commercial and in-house informatics solutions across uh, the R&D spectrum. Uh, everywhere from early stage research through late stage research. And Dave can always be reached at ddorset at asterixinc.com. So Dave, I'll ask you to come in and do a quick introduction. If you want to expand on any of that, um, <clears throat> you're welcome to, but uh, I'll let you kind of pick up from here and uh, and and you can, you can take it. Sure, I think we'll pretty much more or less just get right into it. And I guess the only thing I might add is that, <clears throat> uh, you know, I've spent considerable amount of that time in 30 years um, both on the vendor side of the world, um, designing, architecting, engineering um, solutions that are, were offered, are still offered by vendors. Um, I've also spent a considerable amount of time on the consuming side, if you will. Um, I spent about 10 years at Bristol Myers Squibb, um, spent more other time, you know, as CIO of a material science research company. So I've got I've got sort of I think an interesting set of experiences from both sides of that those coins and we'll, that'll come up a little bit later, which is why I want to just expand on it a little bit more. But for now we'll, we'll move on and get into the actual topic here. So there's been there's been a couple of webinars I've done you know on on the significance and the role of architecture um, or enterprise architecture within sort of the R and D space. Um, I've talked in the past in past webinars about the general nature of these architectural assessments and roadmaps and, and uh, why you want to do those things. And today we're going to review some of this information and provide a little bit, you know, more recent uh, information around um, 
the types of things we've been doing recently in assessments and roadmaps. And I really want to try to give you a picture of what to expect. Um, you know, if you are engaged in an architectural assessment in your R&D organization, and also why these, and, and sort of a refresh on, on why this is, I believe, an essential activity uh, for, for um, R&D organizations um, of any size. Uh, and uh, and so that's that's really sort of what the intention of today's webinar actually is. So a little bit of background of my definition, at least of what I call RDRT IT architecture, um, and and the role of an architect, well, um, within within the R and D sort of overarching um, systems organization. Um, from my perspective, the architect's reason to exist, to the the benefit or the value proposition, if you will, of what an architect should be bringing to you is really in, in assisting and managing the complexity. Um, however, we, you know, whenever we look at the overall activities and across the R&D organization from a scientific point of view, from a business process point of view, from the technology point of view that's required to support those activities, um, you know, it's a fairly complex, lots of moving parts, lots of moving parts in different directions, lots of vendors, lots of you know dependencies and inter interrelationships between systems and that complexity you know is is pretty much the you know that is essentially the you know um uh, an inevitable outcome in a sense of, of what we're doing across the r d spectrum which is a complex activity in and of itself the real role of an architect is to try to help manage that complexity um, what an architect should be able to contribute, um, you know, the the reason you would bring in bring in someone with experience and, and to try to help, like looking at the overall system, you know, is to help you bring, you know, a lot a picture to that to what your overall systems are that helps you understand how to best manage it against those business processes going forward. R and D architecture really should be putting the scientists first. Um, you know, what an architect sort of speaks to is the sort of a little diagram picture over there is between the what and the how. Um, so with one foot in each camp, um, where the what is essentially the scientific aspect of things, um, the what must embrace, you know, what actually goes on in the real world of laboratories. So we are full of, lab in laboratory and research work, we're full of planned and unplanned change. Uh, from all sorts of different directions. Um, that's the fundamental nature of research, and bringing that sort of understanding and that and that appreciation of the way things are from a what perspective is a key role of an architect, key back, key part of the background of an architect. The other foot of an architect, and the other foot of architecture, is the how, and that's the technology part of things, um, and that's the familiarity and experience and understanding of appropriate uses of technology let's just say and uh you know where where what can be used or reused um, to help simplify things from the technology landscape point of view and and where um pushing a technology you know into a particular solution role might be pushing the technology too far for that matter so really you know part of part of this overall goal of r d architecture is really providing you know the overall holistic environment that provides the flexibility that we need from a science point of view um, so that the long-term usability of our laboratory IT systems are, are kept in mind. You know, that we make the right compromises, we make the right choices for near-term needs, long-term needs, and the inevitability of change, you know, in that. So this is this is sort of my picture of the uh, you know what you should be asking for from an architect, help help them simplifying things. You should be able to get simple descriptions of you know what the key architectural elements are, what, what the key architectural you know concepts and principles actually are, and that language should express both the scientific language, the, the language of R and D, as well as the technical language. Your architect really needs to have a foot in each of those camps. When we look around, when I look around today, uh, most work that gets labeled as architecture um, that I've seen is really focused on meeting functional requirements. And you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, obviously, meeting the functional requirements that are necessary for our systems to support R and D is a critical part of being successful within any of our projects. But one of the 
one of the other things I think that uh, one of the things I think we don't spend in quite enough time on uh, from an overall architecture point of view and then into the actual systems themselves are those non-functional requirements. So years after implementation, um, a lot of the big issues tend to be things in this, this is a subset of the list of non-functional types of requirements of our systems. So, you know, after we achieve initial implementation, um, you know, we have some ill at ease issues for performance issues, reliability issues, scalability issues with our systems, because these weren't necessarily considered even, you know, you know, in, these weren't enough consideration wasn't paid to these during the initial time, time of things. We were focused on the func on the pure functional aspects. Um, another important area of non-functional requirements that architects should be uh, speaking to, cognizant of, um, is the administrative aspect. So this is a direct, this has direct impact on your total cost of ownership of systems over the years. You know, how easily can an incident be diagnosed? Because things will happen. This is software. It is all full of bugs. <laughs> um, and, uh, and, and, you know, having a system that is designed in such a way to facilitate, you know, the, the activities that need to happen to diagnose when something goes wrong is an important aspect of, a, of having a system that's going to be, that's going to be practically useful, is not going to cost you fortune, you know, in terms of administrative cost, and also be helpful, you know, also be useful from a user's point of view in terms of like minimizing, the faster you can get to diagnosis, the faster you can get to resolution of incidents, bottom line. Um, general costs, um, and in particular up, upgrades, updates and upgrades, um, our software vendors, providers of, of some of our systems are, you know, say constantly releasing pretty much um, patches and minor versions and even major versions. And from an architectural point of view, lack of attention to the deployment architecture, or lack of attention to the coupling of our, of our systems and the way that they're actually integrated uh, can really make these minor updates, you know, very painful, uh, very costly. Um, and certainly from the point of view of being able to stay, you know, being able to take advantage of the fixes and the changes and the enhancements that our systems, that our vendors actually provide us, this is an important area that's not paid enough attention to from an architectural point of view. Um, and it is a key element of the architecture itself to enable this. Um, you know, there are, uh, so let's say, you know, better and worse practices from the standpoint of how systems are actually integrated with each other uh, that actually play quite a play strongly into this these as aspects of administration and update. And then of course, back to some of the points I was making on the earlier slide, we need the flexibility for new workflows and integrations. Um, you know, the life, life in the R&D labs are, is going to change, new instrumentation, uh, new approaches, new methods, not not the least of which might be uh, changes in strategy from a from a company perspective, going into new therapeutic areas, going into new modalities. Uh, you know, all this begs for the flexibility in our systems. We need the the ability to rewire uh, business processes and workflows, incorporate new components um, that speak to you know sort of very tight disciplines, if you will, of the science, uh, new analysis. Um, and, and overall overarching new data flows. Um, so, you know, that, that type of flexibility is a critical um, success factor in the long-term view of a system. Um, obviously, when you build a system, you spec out the integrations that are required and the workflows that it's going to support, you implement, and you can call it success on that. But if that system is going to live uh, for any significant amount of time, it has got to be architected. To provide the kind of flexibility that it was actually required. So a little bit, you know, about what an assessment process, an architectural sort of assessment process, actually looks like. So there's there's some variability in this. Uh, this is kind of a high level, sort of more generic view of this. A lot of the details here, and even some of the, you know, some of the depth in which some of these things go into some of these things depends on the actual. Um, company that we're working with and, and sort of where they stand from a life cycle perspective, where they stand from a needs perspective, et cetera. But overall, overall, the general process is to survey the current state. And while we're doing that, capturing, you know, folks uh, input on the high level future state needs. So where are the frustrations? What's working well? You know, that's another important aspect. 
uh, to be capturing this because as part of an assessment, you know, we don't want, we want to make sure that we're not calling out um, changes in, in areas that don't need to be changed, um, to be honest. So as, you'll, as we'll talk about in a moment, part of this assessment is getting, getting practical guidance on where, you know, going forward. So capturing those, those future state needs, you know, as we're surveying the current state, um, one of the important things that is unique, relatively speaking, about R&D informatics as opposed to informatics and in other sorts of industries, um, you know, financial industries or, or the retail industries, et cetera, is that it is important, critically important, um, in our systems architectures and our systems design that we are paying attention to both the flow of materials and data. Um, in a laboratory environment, uh, you know, the flow of materials in between groups um, often corresponds to the flow of data between systems and, and, you know, keeping an eye essentially on both of those aspects during this part of an assessment, uh, looking for those, those, uh, those opportunities for efficiency gains, opportunities for uh, scientific gains really requires an understanding of both those flow of materials and data. Materials here is a pretty general statement. Um, in the pharmaceutical world, this would this could pertain to both, you know, candidate drug product, uh, API, um, as well as samples, uh, biological materials, um, samples for any form of assay analysis. So it is a very broad definition I'm using here uh, when I'm speaking of materials around the lab. Any physical things that are flowing, really. Um, the second part of the assessment process, then, after this initial survey is really now using that information across the, the part of the organization we're, we're working with, um, really now organizing and prioritizing the needs across all those processes. So we're really trying to factor out um, the groups of capabilities that, are, that can be used or need, are needed um, by multiple parts of the organization, or those, those gaps that are critical to the flow of data or the flow of material you know, through the organization. So this is a form of a gap analysis. Um, we're really looking you know, at the use of the data here and by the type of the data. This is not an attempt to introduce three letter acronyms. Um, we try to avoid telling you there's a limb system that you need or there's an ELN that you need. Uh, those TLAs, which you might come back to a little bit, um, that's the vendor world speaking. Um, and and you know, the vendor world needs to, you know, they have, requirements of their own in their own business models um, to be able to characterize the products that they offer and the market that they offer them to, et cetera. When we're on the ground really looking at, you know, looking at how to um, help an R&D organization with their data management, you know, I don't, I don't think in terms of those three letter acronyms. We're really looking at the scientific processes that are going on, the type of data that's flowing, the type of materials that are moving around, and really focused on identifying the capabilities that are important. The reflection of that into the vendor systems and what TLAs are needed, you know, that'll happen later on in the process, but it's not something we want to be doing early. We don't want to be biasing ourselves um, to, uh, to fitting a particular um, vendor three-letter acronym into, into the solution profile at this stage. Um, once we have that sort of organization and characterization and uh, you know, gaps and opportunities, um, then we're really sort of looking at how to reflect that into the system space. So here we'd be looking at you know, what foundational systems exist within the company. So what, what's already in place um, you know, to manage everything from you know, master data across systems, uh, what's in your infrastructure, uh, what other kinds of systems do you have in the non-functional requirement space, application performance monitoring, those types of things, for example, uh, and what the overall deployment strategy might be. And, you know, for example, cloud first is obviously a very important uh, characteristic of a lot of IT strategy these days. Um, cloud first has a lot of, you know, a lot of nuance to it. Um, so part of assembling essentially these capability gaps and everything into the roadmap is then sort of projecting it into those aspects of the, of the company. Um, as I mentioned before, in the flexibility side of things, we really want to uh, provide a means uh, ultimately for the system or systems involved here to be able to have incremental releases of capabilities. That might be both in terms of a build out plan, um, 
So, you know, the idea uh, is to really build uh, groups of, or sort of minimal, minimal viable groups of capabilities out. Uh, that leaves you the flexibility to learn and change. So rather than sitting down and specking out the entire end to end solution of something, uh, we try to lay out a roadmap that can, can deliver value in individual steps, but leave you the flexibility to learn and change, you know, as that as that's going on. Uh, one of the challenges, you know, with any of these things, and this is spoken to a little bit in the people aspects, once you release, you know, new components or new capabilities from a data management, you know, kind of point of view into, into use, um, you know, the nature of the process flow changes or should change. Um, that may shift around what's actually the most important, you know, gap uh, that needs to be addressed. So that's an important part of assembling this into, into sort of what are the candidate systems and what is the roadmap is recognizing that, okay, you're going, you know, we're recommending that you pursue these particular capabilities first, um, you know, and then, and then there's a decision point based on, you know, essentially the, the, the success and the usage of that. Um, or what might actually follow. Um, the other thing that we want to address, of course, in this in this overall roadmap of sort of the outcome of the assessment process are some of the people-oriented aspects of our systems. And that includes governance and quality and things like collaborative operations. So uh, you know, outside the organization, um, how the growth of the organization or potential growth of the organization might change, might change the landscape. You know, M&A is, is another sort of one of those variables in things. A um, little hard to predict, of course, <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, something that's important from an overall, from an overall roadmap point of view, um, system design and uh, flexibility point of view. So that's a little bit about what, we're, what we try to, you know, about how we go about, you know, sort of with, in one of these assessments. Uh, a little bit more about why you might want to do this, and hopefully some of this has become clear through the discussion so far, um, you know, really what what you're what you're able to get here is external advice from an experienced perspective. So you really want to be able to leverage, you know, um, best practices from multiple sources. Um, I'll tell you from a data management point of view, you know, pharmaceuticals, consumer products, chemicals, lots of lots of different areas. There's a lot of, of similar problems from a data flow perspective across these organizations, even though obviously the form of the science and everything differs, but there's a lot to be learned from each other in general across the more general R&D uh, space. Um, the other thing that an assessment helps with is giving you an external eyes on your current state and gaps and priorities. Um, you know, when you're when you're there, when you're a part of the organization, obviously um, your day-to-day -day life, you know, is generally, um, you know, more to the most for the most part, pretty much heads down, you know, in in what the particular issues are. And an assessment is an opportunity to sort of have somebody with, relatively speaking, a naive perspective from your organizational point of view, but with a background in science and the lab processes and in the technology, as we were speaking about before. Um, really come and look at, you know, with respect to best practices and what other folks are doing and what technologies are available. Look at look at what uh, what your current states and gaps and priorities should be. Um, we all have inadequate funding and inadequate resources to do all of the work that is being asked of us. Um, and uh, and and sort of really, you know, having that kind of a discussion around, you know, what is what is potentially a better pathway. Uh, in terms of the spend of that scarce money and resources uh, that could offer, you know, you can offer the max, maximize the benefits. Um, and, you know, though, I wanted to sort of return a little bit here, you know, about the sort of the depth of the, the depths of architecture here with sort of the capital A, you know, I think most, there is a bias a lot of times in folks that I talk with that, that uh, you know, it's really something that only the commercial software vendors should worry about, right? You want to see your commercial software vendor have a, a good roadmap and an architecture and you know I mean all the all those kinds of things and why why is this important for you know for somebody doing R and D for you know sort of on the customer side if you will of things as opposed to the commercial software vendor. So I want to talk just a little bit about this. Um, 
the goal of an architecture, ultimately, you know, back to what we talked about before, is to have, you know, some ability to be quote unquote future proof. Now, I don't believe anything can be fully future proof uh, from a practical point of view, but you know, the goal is to have a solid roadmap and a path forward and a vision uh, for you know what benefit your system or systems are actually going to deliver to the science. Um, my personal belief, having been on both sides of the coin from a commercial perspective and and the uh, and the actual R and D perspective, execution of R and D perspective, um, is that our internal systems, those of us who practice R and D, actually have a stronger need than commercial systems uh, for a strong architecture. And the way one way I have of explaining this or have, getting people to think about this is, think of the game, the little the art uh, there is a um, um, sculptural pictorial of the game of Crock the Whip, if you're familiar with that from uh, being a kid or your own kids. Um, each of those individual, if you think of each of those individual kids in that chain as being a system or a vendor, um, you know, they have, you know, they have a role to play, they have a, you know, they have a space, if you will, sort of in the chain of things. Um, but all kinds of different effects start to happen when you chain them together. Uh, like this, and depending on the actions of the person in front and the person that's you know half that's in the middle, etc., a lot of interesting, let's just say, dynamics can happen with the other individuals in the chain. And I like to use this as analogies. What we're really doing in an R and D environment is connecting. No single vendor provides us everything that we need. Um, so we are we are beholden to the connectivity of a whole number of systems. Um, in both automated and manual fashion. And it's a game of crack the whip to, to a large extent. We want each of our individual systems to behave well, to stay in its lane um, so that it doesn't torture the other systems essentially down the line. Everybody is able to move you know, in, a, in a reasonable, predictable, flexible, clear way. Um, and this is sort of, this is, the combination of these systems, the impact of actually bringing all the systems together to meet an end-to-end -end need, being such a thing that you know vendors don't go all the way to that mile, right? So they they specify, architect, have a roadmap, have a vision, execute, engineer, deliver, test, etc. In a similar way to being one of the kids in that crack the whip chain. Um, they're not able to, you know, from their perspective, it's a big challenge for vendors to actually understand how their system interplays with all of the other systems. And this aspect of architecture, this particular aspect of R&D architecture, not just software architecture, but R&D architecture end to end, is really why I think it's actually more important for those of us in the R&D space to actually pay more attention to architecture, even than our commercial vendors. Um, the one comment I've, I've already made this, I think, before was that, you know, there is no such, you know, all that said, there's no such thing as a best architecture, right? There are better choices than other choices um, from a technical and architectural point of view. And there are metrics or, or concepts that we use as architects, technical concepts that we use, like coupling, for example, and, and uh, abstraction, encapsulation, and all these types of things that we can create measures essentially allow us to create measures of architectural approaches. And is this is this one better than that one? Well, it has a different it has different levels of coupling, it has different levels of abstraction, you know, that would allow this or that or whatever. And that's all the technical speak essentially behind it. The truth is that all of those things are non, you know, they're they're not. Um, there's a lot of compromises involved. And, and you know you might have a system that's high on one aspect of the scale and low on other aspects of the scale, and that may be better suited um, to your particular needs and requirements from a science perspective. That's why again we're back to one foot in each of the camps as being one of the absolute critical things. Um, so there's no such thing as a best architecture. Unfortunately, there's no book you can read or website that you can go to that's just going to answer that question for you. Um, you know, you'll find catalogs of patterns and you'll, you'll find technical terms like the ones I, I threw out there and, and, and such, but actually applying them in a practical sense in the real world is a matter of, you know, really managing the compromises uh, and managing some key principles. Uh, 
Um, so there's no such thing as best architecture, and it's the same as there's no single approach to discovering and developing a, a new product, drug product, or chemical product. Um, we all, all of us do it a little differently. All of us have strengths and weaknesses and different aspects of our culture and all of those types of things that are important aspects of having a best fit architecture. So just a final couple of words here on, 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 on you know, I'm just trying to wrap up some of these themes. Um, you know, talked a lot about like what, what we really, you know, what the role of architecture is. And fundamentally, at the end of the day, what we really want out of our systems is we want our overall environment and our overall systems to, to actually evolve with the way that we work. So we don't want to be trapped <laughs> into, you know, into a way of working, you know, because of a, because it's the way a system actually, you know, provide, provides uh, our, our capability. So we want to be able to have flexibility. We want to have value over time, and we want to be able to carry that forward. We want to be able to scale. We want to be. We want our systems to be clear. Um, we want to be data focused. That's the most permanent output of R and D is the data itself. And and having a strong data focus and paying attention to the data life cycle is a is a critical aspect of getting the architecture into a better place. Um, we also though don't want overthought or engineered <laughs> symbols. And this goes back this goes back to the simplicity statements. Um, I am involved quite frequently with um, the the aftermath, I guess is the right way to say it, of, of this last sub bullet here. Um, you know, good intentions, uh, you know, highly detailed requirements, well thought out, you know, well thought out cases and the benefit side, et cetera, et cetera, but a, but a real, but lack of, lack of sort of some of the levels of practical understandings about what the cost essentially is of overthinking and over engineering things. It is a very common trait among software people. And I can say that because I do software engineering. I do software development, still do, have done uh, throughout my whole life. Uh, I was trained as a chemist originally, but I was always a computer guy. So, um, so I tend to do this. Everybody that I know practices software tends to do this. It sort of comes with the territory in software engineering. Uh, we do make things more complex than they need to be. And part of the role of an architect um, is actually to try to counterpoint as a counterpoint to that. Keep it practical, keep it purposed, ask hard questions. Why is the most, you know, most often practiced question. Uh, really challenge it to keep it simple. Um, because that's a critical part of having the flexibility in the long term. Um, everybody from the science side is familiar with the principle of entropy. Um, in the software world, uh, from an individual systems point of view or multiple systems point of view, you know, the, the equivalent statement is it never gets simpler over time. When a system starts with its first implementation and is put into production, that's as simple as probably it's ever going to be. Um, so, you know, you have to keep that in mind. The system is going to be around for 5, 10, 15 years. Um, that's, a, that's an important uh, important principle to keep in mind. So just to return now a little bit more about the assessment itself, um, what we're really trying to do in an assessment is focus on this bigger picture plan. Um, so we're looking at the terrain uh, of, of the R&D organization and the data flow and the material flow and what the critical gaps are and you know what where the practical benefits of solving some of those problems actually are. Um, this is not a pebble level assessments, uh, meaning that we're not, again, we're not targeting three letter acronyms and specific vendors and those types of things. Not that there isn't a level of specificity here. You want, obviously we need the roadmap to be an actionable thing, but it is not a project plan per se for implementation of particular systems. It is designed to meet the sort of the Goldilocks zone. So, you know, low level enough, small enough to find the gaps, but not, you know, sort of, I'm sorry, high enough to find the gaps, but not low enough to actually quantify, fully quantify everything. So at that stage, it would be obviously a massive document uh, with, you know, what would take a considerable amount of time to put together to detail out all of the project plans that were involved with plugging all of the gaps, et cetera. So these are, these are terrain level assessments. Um, so again, you know, part of being that is having that broad prioritized set of observations and recommendations. Um, the broadness is an important 
piece of this here. Sometimes these assessments go on around the lines of, we have an old limb system and we want to replace it. That's not really the kind of assessment that I'm speaking about here, the simple singular system replacement. You know, with this type of assessment in mind, what we would want to look at is who's, what is feeding into the limb system? What is the material and data flow like before the limb system and after the limb system? How do the things interconnect? What opportunities and gaps exist in taking that broader viewpoint, more the end to end viewpoint around the system as opposed to a tactical view of I need to replace an old system? An old system. Um, so, so, again, you know, these are the types of examples of, of, of things that, you know, we would, you, would, you should find uh, in the output of an assessment in this roadmap. You know, it should talk about what the capabilities, what capabilities are missing, what do you have, and what's going to work. And, what order should those systems, should those capabilities be uh, be viewed as you know needing to be brought in? Uh, what types of trade-offs between you know those those other uh, those deployment architecture aspects I mentioned before? Things like on cloud versus on-prem. Um, you know where do we? How do we know we're going to meet data quality goals? Um, how do we know we're going to be able to reuse our data? How do we know it's going to be regulatory and compliance? I mean all those types of things. How do we best approach integration so they don't cost us a fortune to maintain and support? Um, all of those types of things is what the these are the these are critical things that the assessment should should speak to. Um, so finally, just a, a little a couple of caveats just about doing assessments. Um, you know, one thing is you are always going to know more about your business. You know, we we try to learn a lot <laughs> as fast as we can. Um, about what your, what your, you know, when important elements of the strategy in particular, but you know, there's a lot about the strategic aspects or polit and political aspects. This isn't political in a bad sense here. This is just the reality of people working together, kind of politics. Um, but, so the depth of these strategic aspects and political aspects, you know, you're going to know more about. And, and as we're developing these assess this assessment, you know, I like to work with work with folks so that. You know, I can bounce ideas off of where the assessment is kind of heading, and I can be told, well, that can't go that way because this, you know, it, because to get the funding, the reality is that it has to be leaned towards this end of the politics. It's like, well, that's that's fine. I mean, you know, this the goal is to have a practical, usable roadmap, so I want to be able to factor those types of things in. Um, this will also play to you know the long-term use of the roadmap and, and such as well. I mean, there are things that are going to change strategically within your company, politically within your company, and and that's just sort of the general caveat in, in in the sense of you know how how you know detailed of a roadmap can actually be practical. The other, it's not so much a caveat as as it is just sort of the general a general statement is that one of the keys to making the uh, the assessment and, the, and an architectural assessment as effective as possible is making sure that we have we have the right people available. Um, when we're surveying the current state and talking about future state needs. Um, you know, if the voices aren't there uh, for us to hear, then, you know, I mean, we do we do bring to the table a lot of things from sort of uh, best practice and experience and all that. But really, you know, having having the availability of the right people and the right people are are is a wide spectrum of folks. Um, and I would say they generally include people that Maybe your um, if you're in the, if you're in the IT group right now, there are going to be people who are on your complainers list. Um, those are good people to talk to, good people to go to, um, you know, in in these types of things. We want to hear from the people who are seriously unhappy, and we also want to hear from the people that are happy and, and sort of the IT partners. Um, so the right people is a is a pretty broad swath. Of folks that we need to gather that input from, and that that's really a critical part of making making an assessment actually uh, um, uh, useful, you know, most useful. So that's pretty much what I wanted to cover today uh, in in terms of the prepared material. Um, so I will, I guess, turn it back over to Kevin. I don't, uh, if we're going to just wrap this or talk questions or. Yeah, Dave. Uh, obviously. Thank you for uh, the content. That was that was great. Um, you know, hope everybody that was on the call, uh, you know, kind of enjoyed it and found it helpful and, and instructive. Certainly, if anybody has any questions that they want to raise right now, you're welcome to do so. So you know how that works is you would simply enter the question uh, into the question 
uh, part of GoToWebinar, uh, and we would read that question out loud. We wouldn't read your name. Uh, we wouldn't read your company or anything along those lines. So um, the one that came up was more of a company-related question. It was more about, um, <clears throat> you know, how, do, how does a company engage with Asterix, um, you know, to begin an assessment like this? So that's really, so, so I would say, you know, obviously my contact information is on the screen, you know, reaching out to me, I can put you in touch with the right people at Asterix to really, uh, you know, sort of go over what the actual engagement process is. Um, you know, that's a, that would be a pretty short discussion, essentially, of sort of what we, what we look for that ends up being, being basically codified in some form of a statement of work uh, that lays out okay, these are the activities that we'll undertake and this is the time, these are the timelines and the people, the rough people that are gonna be involved so that we're, we both have an understanding of the resource and the timelines okay. uh, on both sides. Cool. Uh, so that's that's the general process, yeah. Okay, great. I've got a couple of other questions. I see. So, yep, no, I've Yeah, got, I can see that, I've just pulled up the question panel. I, I have I, So I can see, okay. Yeah, so. Um, so yeah. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Kevin. If if you want to go ahead and, and choose them, I'm happy to. Or I, I can read them out for you, David. It's, it's totally up to you. Okay, I'll, I'll just take them on here. Okay. So um, there was a question about the role of data and in integration standards uh, in the design. So yeah, I mean that is a that's a specific aspect towards the technical end of things. Um, you know, I mentioned technical aspects of the of an assessment. Um, you know, the, there's lots of uh, trite sayings around standards, right? You know, I mean, the great thing about standards is, you know, you, know, you can have as many, you have as many to choose from as you want. Um, <laughs> they are important. I, I'm, I'm not trying to be, I'm not trying to, uh, to, to be overly uh, uh, flippant about them. Um, they are important. I have been personally involved with many standards in the years. Currently, for example, I sit on, uh, I'm, I'm a contributing member in the Allotrope Foundation around the semantic standards of instrument data representation. I have a long history of being involved in standards all over the place. I've been, I was involved in the ASTM rewrite most recently of the uh, system standards around LIMS. Um, so there's a lot to be gained uh, from the use of standards, I will say. Um, they are, uh, they can be helpful. Um, it, but they're not silver bullets, um, I guess is what I would say for the, at least for the, for the time that we have here without getting into great and great details. Um, they are generally helpful, but you know, when they can be over applied and they can become, you know, sort of too much can be a bad thing as well. Um, so it can give you flexibility and particularly in the abstraction, I'll use that term, uh, of data between systems to the extent that you're, you're talking about some type of data exchange uh, that can be uh, covered by a standard, you know, thoroughly and completely, then it can help you in the long term by sort of isolating you some, from some potential vendor specific types of things. That's the biggest use of standards off the top of my head, most effective use of standards off the top of my head. Um, for now, so um, there were some other questions here. So yeah, so again, um, questions here around defining capabilities, um, R&D seeming to know what they do, <laughs> but struggling to convey it into IT forms. Ooh, this is a big one. This is the, this is the core, the, the biggest fundamental problem, frankly, in software engineering is there's no, there's no methodology and no no mechanism, no technology, no methodology for actually how to write good requirements um, from a technical from an implementation point of view. That's one of the core issues across all of IT. Um, there are I I lean towards what I would call a breakdown approach. Um, I've been through just about every methodology that there has been in the last 30 years, um, you know, in this particular space, and I'll spare you all the buzzwords. Um, I like to break down and compartmentalize things. Um, I've talked about the material flow I've talked, and the data flow as being like, that's, that's a big, big piece of the breakdown. And there are ways of engaging the scientific community to elaborate on both of the, on those fronts in those particular ways in, in sort of the Q and A kind of mode, um, making sure you're drawing out aspects of the, of the materials as well as drawing aspects of the data. Where does your data go? Who do you get that from? Um, you know, who do you deliver that report to? Uh, and and the other key, just again, off the top of my head, sort of in working with R&D to draw out, you know, these systems needs, the other real key principle to me 
is this can't entirely be done effectively from a conference room and, and from whiteboards. You've got to get into labs and walk around. The whole nature of R&D is lab work, um, or, or a big part of the nature of, I mean, we're obviously doing more and more computational things, but, but lab work is key to what we do. And you have to be, you have to walk around, you have to see, you put a scientist in a room with a whiteboard and ask him to describe how they do sample, how they receive samples and do sample prep to run a test. They're gonna write, they're gonna write a good, pretty good, they'll fill up a whiteboard with lots, lots of good information and then go to the lab and watch what really happens. And there'll be a dozen things that didn't make it onto the whiteboard because it's just stuff they do every day. So there's just an assumption and they don't, they don't necessarily think of codifying it that particular way. So in terms of trying to work with R&D and drawing out those key things, you know, breaking things down into materials and data, walking around. Um, another question here. On I think we'll probably uh, have time things. for, we'll have time for one more and then, uh... Okay. And we'll want to wrap. A couple here. We've got a couple good ones. Um, I don't want to. Yeah, well, if you have, some, short, if you have some ones you definitely want to hit. contact information. If you definitely have some ones you want to hit, make sure we do. I know the, the recordings tend to limit when you get around the 50 minute mark, so I just want to be be aware of that. Yeah. I, I'll, I'm, I'm just going to pick pick one here, and no offense to the other other two questions here. but uh, So, um, capabilities that are commonly overlooked and missed. Um, you know, the big one today. Every, there's a buzzword that's been running around for a while now around you know data lakes and and everybody wants to do analytics and use machine learning and et cetera et cetera. Um, the the you know one of the critical aspects of being able to do anything like that there's a critical piece of plumbing um, that's actually involved which is which is I mean in in sort of technical terms it's semantic alignment of data. So when you have multiple labs doing things or multiple people doing things, you know, that impinge upon the same sort of things. You've got folks doing chemical process development and scale up, and then you've got folks doing, doing uh, smaller scale work early on. You're trying to pull all that data together and do analytic kinds of things with it. Aligning that data is really, really challenging. And this is sort of this general space. Again, I'll use another buzzword here that I put in air quotes that nobody can see. Enterprise master data. Um, one of the critic, one of the most uh, common missing things that I see in organizations of all size, R&D organizations of all size, from an IT perspective, is uh, control over master data. Um, you know, there's simple examples that folks generally, most folks have some reasonable control over, things like sample IDs and project IDs, project names, therapeutic area names, things like that. But the importance of the master data to any kind of a, any kind of use reuse of data types of initiatives is immense, and there is relative there are relatively very few organizations who have actually thought deeply about this problem. It is a very difficult problem because the way we describe the science is it constantly evolving, and that poses real technical challenges with how do you actually pull this data together in comparable ways. So the one a very common space that I get engaged with folks these days is in this space of the needs around master data um, and the importance of it in with, in respect to like longer term goals of being able to reuse your data and do these do these analytic things and do things like ML and, and all that, I'll do data lakes and ML and all that kind of stuff. Um, okay. Oh, Kevin? Hey, I am. Uh, I'm here. I'm here. Um, I didn't want. I didn't want to accidentally even talk you, so I, I muted myself. I didn't want any background noise. Um, cool. So yeah, we're at the 150 mark. So I, I want to be. I want to be a respectful of everybody's time, and 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 also YouTube doesn't like videos when they go to a certain uh, size. So I want to make sure we keep our video length uh, appropriate for YouTube. So we're going to go ahead and wrap. And uh, obviously, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, the company, join us. Um, online at asterixinc.com. Uh, from there, you know, a lot of folks follow our blog. We have folks like Dave and, and others who are, who are putting out great content on our blog on a, on a weekly basis, uh, covering a wide array of topics. So follow us there. And certainly if you want to talk in a little more detail about some of the engagements that we do um, with, uh, with life science companies and laboratories, et cetera, uh, by all means, uh, you can reach out to us either directly through Dave uh, here at D Dorset or uh, right on the web on the contact us form and we'll get you in front of the right people. But well, again, I want to thank Dave for your time today. Great presentation. Um, thank all of you for joining us and spending some time uh, this afternoon with us. 
Um, <clears throat> you know, I, I certainly it's challenging times, but we hope we're still uh, providing uh, great information and great services to folks. We want to wish everybody well, uh, stay healthy, and uh, and look forward to uh, to seeing us soon in some upcoming webinars. We do have a bunch planned, so uh, we'll go ahead and wrap the session. Dave, thank you. And any any parting uh, words on your part? Uh, no, I'd like to thank everybody for their for their time and attention today. Hopefully, everybody stays well, healthy, and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Great, the session's now complete. Have a wonderful afternoon, everyone. Thanks.